Okay, uh, good morning and welcome to the March 29th, 2022 meeting of the Needham Board of Health. I'm Rob Partridge, Chair. This open meeting of the Board of Health is being conducted in person and remotely per the Governor's Executive Order of 312 2020 and as amended on June 15th, 2021 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The materials for this meeting have been circulated previously and are available on the town website. This meeting is being recorded. I will introduce each board member. Please respond by saying yes when your name is called. Kathleen Brown? Yes. Ed Cosgrove? Yes. Steve Epstein? Yes. Christina Matthews? Yes. Rob Partridge, yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, so the first item on our agenda is the review of the minutes of February 10th, which we'll do first. I only had one suggestion on this and that was that the minutes reflected that this was in person and remote not just remote i also have one comment on there just to be you don't want to use the word alarm you don't need to h5 <coughs> i think concern might be a better Look at page, I'm sorry, page five. Page five, second paragraph, is supposed to lie. Yeah. <laughs> the only other one I had was um, uh, having to do with, I'm just gonna find it here, sorry. Um, talking about compliance with uh, restaurants and saying um, that we're trying to find interpreters that spoke Chinese. Chinese is not really a language. That's a good point. Um, so I, I thought we should, I can't find it now. Um, but we can either Mandarin or Cantonese or. Yeah. Um, um, the language chosen by the owner, I think that's yeah. just to be correct. Okay, we can make those edits. Uh, okay, any other uh, edits or suggestions on February 10th? Okay. So uh, February 10th, um, a vote to accept as amended. Kathleen? Make the movement, yes, second. Whatever. Ed? Yes. Steve? Yes. Christina? Christina? Sorry about that. We just had, uh, my, my daughter just woke up. She's not well. Um, uh, I just missed, sorry, I just missed the last 30 seconds. Oh, we're just uh, voting to accept. Oh, the minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Ended. Yes. And Rob is yes. Okay. So that passes. And then uh, March 4th. Um, does anybody have anything? No. Uh, it's pretty straightforward meeting. <clears throat> okay. Uh, a motion to accept. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, so that carries. Um, okay, uh, new team members. Who's next? Uh, welcome to the new team members. Um, I don't know how many of them are on the call because everybody's behind me, but. Um, Tim, did you want to say anything about sure. so we had anybody a, a, who's um, now joining us? Staff member bios. Uh, there's been a number of additions to the public health division, uh, and there's still a few more uh, planned. Um, we've added, um, and we're quite happy about it, two staff members that are helping with um, public health accreditation and special projects. Uh, that's Cindy Melanson and Jessica Kent. Um, we've added, sorry, I think we should have disabled chat, but no, we did not. Um, 
figure out how to disable that later. Um, we've added some part-time staff on our regional grant. Um, we have two regional grants, one um, for case investigation and contact tracing services with Dover and Medfield, and another sharing environmental health services with Dover and Medfield. Um, so we have had in place for a couple months now uh, the part-time contact tracers. We've added uh, a young man named Roland Abentori, who's one of our environmental health agents that we're going to share uh, regionally. And um, we're interviewing later this week for the other position. Um, I don't think there's any. Uh, oh, and I'm not sure we've announced it, but uh, Diana Costa started. I'm going to get forget that. I think it was March 1st uh, in her new role managing our regional shared service grants. Um, and it's not official yet, but um, we did uh, conduct a search for a full-time environmental health agent and Allie Littlefield, who's been our environmental health intern for the past 18 months, I think, uh, is going to move into that position. Great. So a lot of new things going on, a lot of new positions. Um, we do have a lot of grants, so we're looking to fill those as much as possible. There are Certainly a lot of challenges right now. The uh, public health workforce is in high demand because there is a lot of state funding that's flowing to health departments and regional health districts to add staff. Uh, so it's very competitive, but uh, we're very happy with having a lot of quality people here. Yeah, as I read the bios, I was impressed by the talented people that we have working in the health department and just the, the varied educational experience and just life experience uh, things that they bring yeah. uh, to the health department. So we're lucky to, to work with all of these colleagues and new colleagues as well. Welcome. Yeah. New people coming in. Tim, who are we sharing the part-time position with? What other departments? Dover and Medfield. So Dover, Dover and Medfield Health Department, okay. yeah. That makes sense. Um, so uh, that was partially the result of uh, we, we worked with them. Um, normally, we work with uh, the NCA group, which is uh, Wellesley, Dedham, Westwood, Canton, Milton, Walpole, Norwood. Um, I think that's open. Um, Denise uh, Garlic, the state rep, covers Needham and also Dover and parts of Medfield, uh, asked us to uh, work potentially with Dover and Medfield because they have more limited capacity. Um, Medfield has for the first time a full-time staff member this year, uh, but historically they haven't had any full-time staff and Dover doesn't have a full-time staff person either. Um, so I think it, um, it's a great opportunity. I think there's um, some challenges with not having professional counterparts to work with. There's a lot of contracts. Uh, there's also a lot of board members um, in some instances putting on high boots and going out into the muck. Um, so I think it, it's a very different sort of way of, of doing public health. But we're looking forward to working. <clears throat> Glad to see some of the recommendations of the uh, statewide commission starting to get picked up on. Yes, and um, it's it's separate from our work, but the state's office of local and regional health, with um, Sam Wong heads at the Union the Special Commission on Local and Regional Health, um, they've put out some technical assistance grants to a variety of statewide agencies. Um, I saw those to help with um, capacity building, capacity assessments, intermunicipal uh, relations and contracts. Uh, so a pretty wide array of things. They're really trying to step up the work they do to support local public health. Mm -hmm. Certainly is welcome. I think that's from the uh, safe funding uh, from, from Denise. It is, and there's, um, it's right now in the uh, Committee on Healthcare Financing, but SAFE 2.0 and for, Folks, I can't remember. I think it's strengthening access to public health excellence. S A P H E. Like yeah. Uh, Safe 2.0 is is currently uh, under consideration in the legislature, which would continue the uh, idea of providing funding for shared public health services uh, and attaching to those uh, to that funding some requirements for uh, capacity, um, meeting statutory obligations, credentialing of uh, staff members. Um, in most, if not all cases, Needham wouldn't really have to worry about meeting the statutory requirements because we exceed, um, we exceed them in every category and our workforce is very well credentialed. Yeah. Uh, but for some communities, that's more of a challenge. Carol. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, and I've said it briefly before through Zoom, 
Um, I really appreciate speaking with my Medfield Board of Health hat on how Tim and Tiffany have gone above and beyond during a pandemic with all the challenges to extend themselves, apply for these grants and support my community. Um, we're really profoundly grateful and it's exactly what the special commission had in mind, right? To, mm -hmm. to um, go in, support, scaffold, not replace any employees, whether they're part-time or contract. But um, we really appreciate it because with the way our um, tax base is, we are not gonna build staff. Um, we're primarily residential and have constraints. So it is a huge uh, gift to us. Those are the right words, but um, and it's not it's not easy. It's a whole other whole other job. It seems to be working out pretty much as we envisioned it. And with and Tim and Tiffany know this with our regional SAPSI grant when DPH did the regional prevention funding. You know, it it it's hard because you're bringing in knowledge to communities that want to expand but yet don't have any dedicated staff and. You're building relationships, so it's huge. It's it's exactly what you worked on, right. and we appreciate it because we only have a full time public health nurse, a part time person whose office phones administration, and a contracted environmental health agent. That's that's the staff for a growing town. So we're grateful. Great, thank you, Carol. We're, we're fortunate too. Um, okay, so moving on uh, to staff reports for February, um, emergency management. Michael. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I think the big one to highlight is the hazard and vulnerability assessment. Uh, Tim and I have been working with our contractor uh, beside, behind the scenes to get that all up and going. So we have the final uh, tool completed. It's very closely aligned with Region 4AB. Uh, so we'll be able to you know, assess ourselves against the uh, local uh, region as well. Uh, at Monday's local emergency planning committee meeting, we're gonna go over the tool in advance. Uh, and then at Monday's LAPC meeting, uh, uh, sorry, May's uh, LAPC meeting on May 9th, uh, taking place from 11 to one at public safety building. Uh, the local emergency planning committee will conduct the hazard and vulnerability assessment uh, as a group. Uh, and as always, that meeting is uh, entirely open to the public if people wanted to go and attend. Uh, the other big thing from February that I want to highlight. Is that also going to be remote? Uh, it's it's not, at, not at this time. We don't okay. have plans to make it remote. What's the date for that? Uh, May, 9th. May 9th. It's a Monday, yes. Yeah, 11 mm -hmm. to 1. Okay. Uh, the other thing was uh, at our February leadership meeting for the town staff, uh, we had MEMA come and they provided a Until Help Arrives class, which is uh, trains the general public on how you can respond to an emergency from time an incident happens um, until the first, first responders arrive. Uh, it was very well received. I think MEMA did a great job and they're always looking to host uh, uh, more of those classes. Uh, so, you know, if there's anyone uh, watching this or that has a, a group or an organization that you think could benefit from that class, uh, you can reach out to me uh, and I'll work with Mima to get that scheduled for anyone. Great. Great. Um, questions for Michael? Okay. Great, thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, could you send out a send an email about the uh, May 9th meeting? I will. Location and everything. Yeah. Just to remind me. Thank you. Um, okay, moving on. Um, emergency management support. Yes, yeah, so I'll do Talib. He's not here. Um, so he has been working on writing uh, drive-through plan for our PCR testing. Should the state ever give us the ability to go do it? Um, so he completed that for us, uh, coordinating some MRC shelter trainings. We're going to have Red Cross come um, in a couple Saturdays to do shelter training with some of our MRC volunteers. And then the nursing staff and I will be doing a CPR training for the MRC. 
Um, and then we, she, he is continuing to work with NC8 for our um, MRC activation um, and all things that go with MA response with NC8. So. Okay, yeah, I got an email about that too. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Tiffany, can I ask you a quick question about um, regarding the drive-through testing? What 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 the challenges are in getting that up and going? I have to get a um, CLIA waiver, and I have yet to hear back. I've emailed the state three times, and I've gotten no response. I've turned in the application and everything, but still can't get anybody to call me back. So I can't actually order the machine until I have that CLIA waiver in hand. Okay. So just waiting. And we may have to pivot if I don't get it, and I don't know, do home tests or something. I don't know. And that's state jurisdiction, not federal? Requirement. It's state. So it's, it goes through CMS, but each state has their own department that approves it. That's, so. a, that's a DPH, is it? It is DPH, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering whether or not if it's, if it's really CMS, yeah. whether or not to you know, contact the regional. So on the CMS or... website, it says call your state local division of whichever. So it sends me to DPH. I'm in charge of that these days. Right. But... Oh, um, yeah, yeah, really, because that's all. I just, we have to pay a fee. I googled like, is it because I signed it as the director as, as a nurse? And yeah. said, as long as the person knows how to do the process, it, it doesn't have to be anybody specific. So, yeah. so all right. Yeah, it's just if they're directing you to the state, the state not being responsive. It might be time to pick up the phone and call Region One of CMS and say, look, we're we're doing what we're supposed to do, and you yeah, get them to call me back. Right, yeah. 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 Okay. We'll try one more time with the state because we have some people's personal cell phone numbers for that yeah. but we belong to region one of cms yeah i believe so yes. yeah. who's in charge of that at the state level uh it would be yeah. someone probably quality and healthcare, healthcare quality, quality. Healthcare yeah quality. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um i my original contact that i emailed who sent me that information um she couldn't do it any further after that so hopefully yeah, at some point i know they're retired so. yeah but we're ready to rock and roll with it as soon as we get that machine and do it. So, okay. Okay. Other questions uh, for Tiffany on emergency management support? All right. Thank you. Um, on to public health nursing. I can't tell who's with us, but um, yeah, you've got Mary this morning. Good morning. Morning. Um, so uh, Hannah and I have been hard at work with our students as per usual this time of year. Um, I received uh, another order of Narcan and have been working on offering uh, take home naloxone programming. Um, my big undertaking for uh, the last month is actually a little addendum on the end as per the conversation with Dr. Epstein about hepatitis C. Um, I went back and I reviewed the last four years of hepatitis C cases and um, realized this is more of a, a disconnect in reporting rather than an indication that we, our case count has gone up. Um, and I, I, I included a write up there. Um, and that has also kind of prompted me to relook at how we do our, um, our monthly report to you about infectious diseases. Um, as I've been made to understand it, the report was originally written um, by the previous nurse as which cases she actually worked over the course of the month. And I've taken it to be a better, more of a comprehensive indicator of what diseases are latent in the population. And it wasn't really written uh, or that it wasn't designed to give that information. So I'm, I'm working on a rehash of the spreadsheet that we give you every month so that you get a better idea of what we're actually working on and which ones are just latent in the community. If you have any specific questions, I am open to them. No, but thank you, Mary, for doing the work. I know it's a, I know it's a big job, but um, I, I think you uncovered something that's gonna help us moving forward. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, Sorry, I wanted to chat with Mary. Did you wanna to touch on the TB and the Ukraine? Oh, so um, it's not quite an issue yet. It's something that we're looking into. Um, the way we currently do tuberculosis reporting is just essentially the cases that we work. It doesn't talk about latent infection or people who've tested positive and are determined to not be infectious or anything else. So um, that is going into the, my um, kind of redesign, but 
just a, something that's been rolling around in, in circles like the, um, the National Tuberculosis Day last week touched on it briefly is that Ukraine is, I believe the fourth highest tuberculosis um, or has the fourth highest rate of tuberculosis in Europe. And so if we are to see, and I'm, I'm sure we already are, um, an increase in refugees, then we're likely to see an uptick in latent tuberculosis infections. Um, I think it's important to note that we don't, even though we've got a handful of people who test positive and need them every year, we don't have anybody with active TB, but I think something that needs to be undertaken by me in the coming months is a bit more outreach to explain that tuberculosis exists and um, you know that testing and, and treatment is not only available, but important. Many of them are probably DCG vaccinated, right? Yes. I would think so. Yeah, so I, I guess I was going to ask. Yeah, so that just make sure we're doing the appropriate testing for those individuals. Yeah, so the way it works right now in the state is, or in the country is anybody that comes through New York um, gets tested automatically there, and then they get flagged to the respective state and or wherever address they put in. And then we get notification to be aware that this person may be coming, and then that's where we do contact with them once they arrive. Um, so we're, we're anticipating a little bit of an increase potentially in the next few months. So. Okay. All right. Uh, other questions for Mary? Uh, Mary, is there anything else? I'm all set. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank, you. thank you for the update. Uh, and and uh, seconding what Steve said about the hepatitis C work, that really helped clarify things. Um, okay. Substance use prevention is next. Karen? Good morning. Morning. Um, I'll just give a quick summary here. Our focus really last month was on um, bringing some mental health topics to the community. We um, acknowledge particularly its intersection with substance use. So we got a couple of things um, out there on our social media pages. We um, started something called Mental Health Minutes, where we interviewed uh, behavioral health providers in the community just to give some very quick targeted responses to um, mental health related questions for community members who might be trying to navigate a situation with their family and giving them some, as I said, sort of targeted tips for that. We're also um, just coming off of an event that we held uh, actually this month, but the planning for a um, virtual event for the SPAN quarterly meeting where we brought in New Hampshire Supreme Court, former New Hampshire Supreme Court um, Justice John Broderick to tell to share his story about um, mental health and substance use in his family. So we um, can share more about that later. But um, the other um, update I wanna share is that regarding our STOP Act grant program, we we're wrapping up our January tips training that we conducted and um, we're looking now to plan our next session with Carol and Officer Jason Sullivan from the Denton Police Department. And uh, we'll be getting ready for that session in June. And we're also working with the police department for scheduling the next alcohol compliance check that's coming up before June. Um, and that's oh, and one other thing we did with our grant funds from the Stop Act grant. We purchased the We Card calendars for all of our alcohol licensees. It's a tear off daily um, page that helps them verify the minimum age requirement for selling alcohol to a patron. So we hand delivered all of those as a sort of a, a way to help boost their best practices. Were they accepted by most of the vendors? Um, they a, were. In they fact, were. Um, they were quite grateful for them. So we're hoping that they'll put those to use immediately. And um, perhaps that will incite them to continue making that purchase for themselves every year. It's a, a nominal cost for a business to buy one, but a, a very valuable tool to have. Sure. Good reminder yes. for every day for people. Yeah. 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 It's a great idea because we had a couple of compliance checks with. They just did the math wrong, it sounds like. Right. They sort of looked at the ID. And so that's kind of interesting. It's a good idea. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, any questions for Karen? Karen, um, I just wondered if you had, I see that the vaping grant is wrapping up. I wondered if you had any kind of um, final thoughts on how, how that went, if it was utilized as expected or, I mean, I know it was, it, it took place in the past two years. So I can imagine, you know, we didn't have as many um, high schoolers participate, but I'm just curious, you know, how, because I think once we get the results of, of the Metro West Adolescent Health Survey in the next few months, we'll also see where we are with this issue. Um, yeah, and I'm curious what, what you found and, you know, that's something you see us, you know, maybe reapplying for in the future. Um, thank you for the question. We'll have more of a formal summary about the grants um, effectiveness, I think, uh, in the coming months. But I can tell you that um, I think what you may be referring to is the, the youth vaping cessation program that we launched with um, this grant to Needham High School during the pandemic. Um, we spoke recently with one of the school nurses at the high school and she did report that there has been very little utilization of the cessation program and one of the things that she pointed to was um, it's it's all well and good and easy enough for them to share um, information about the cessation program with a prospective youth who uh, maybe is in a conversation where vaping, their vaping use is discussed. And the nurses know the tools for implementing this, um, the one-on-one the -on -one intervention of the program. But where we're um, seeing a challenge is how do you share information to a student about the program and then get them to actually want to do the work. Um, and that is, that is probably something that we will take a closer look at with our school um, health staff to see where we might be able to support the school nurses better in that in-between step of, as I mentioned, um, describing what the program is and then actually having a student want to, to participate in it and to feel ready to even explore the option of cessation. So um, I'll hope to have a little more on that as time goes on, but we're, we're um, hopeful that we can keep our cessation opportunities really alive and fresh, either through renewed training with the, the school nursing staff and expanding the promotion through the school and through the parent community about the opportunity for cessation. Mm. And you feel you'll be able to continue that work without the grant? I think so, because what the grant enabled us to do was to have a staff person dedicated to all of the startup work for organizing the training of the, the school nurse staff, bringing in the consultant for that, um, and then creating the whole promotion around the vaping program. But I think the follow-up opportunities can certainly be there since we have that relationship with the school health staff. Great. How does it work with a, say a 14 year old comes and asks for help quitting vaping? How do our parents know, like if they're seeing a healthcare staff person, is there an issue with informing the parent or? Um, the, pro <laughs> the program itself is considered confidential okay. in, the, in the sense that a young person under the age of 18 who comes to a school health and voluntarily, it's all voluntary, um, decides they want to undertake, you know, the one-on-one the -on -one sessions with the nurse to explore cessation, it doesn't necessarily have their parent contacted about that. Mm -hmm. I think all school personnel know if things tip into a category where they, they need to report on something, but in general, the program is considered confidential. Mm -hmm. Have there been any recent statistics? Like we have Metro West comes out soon, I think. It okay. does. Um, as to what's going on with vaping in high school, is it up, down, level? You know, we actually don't have any um, quantitative data, unfortunately, until the Metro West comes out. Um, I, I think everything that we've been working with so far, Carol, you can 
bounce this off of us if you've seen something differently, but um, it's pretty much anecdotal where, where youth will say, we're seeing our, we're seeing our peers fade, but um, we don't have any quantitative data yet until we get the Metro West survey, I think hopefully um, by the end of May, early June. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see if there's where it's going. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, great. <clears throat> Thank you, Karen. Um, other questions before we move on to Carol, I believe. Okay. Yes. Carol. <laughs> Just <Call> briefly, <clears throat> our, um, our grant is finally feeling like we're establishing a good foundation. Um, we contracted with uh, Nicole Augustine, who was referred through DPH and BSAS to be our DEI consultant. Um, she has extensive experience in prevention and public health. And we appreciate because our uh, consultant for uh, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion is funded this year and next year. And this is an eight year program and I expect with the commitment of BSAS to this work through an equity lens that they'll continue to do that. And um, the opportunity is for um, training and consultation to really have us not do business as usual and bringing um, diverse community members to the table and being informed and involved in this work and understanding how substance use and, and substance use disorders impact um, uh, community members that, that haven't been to our table. Um, so we're grateful to have that and working through the town processes and contracting and bid, Tiffany and Tim have been incredibly helpful. So I feel like that's great support and you know we have um, a young person who's at BU School of Public Health who works with me. So we're doing key stakeholder interviews with our partners and focus groups and um, doing data collection in our four towns. And hopefully that will uh, coincide with the quantitative data we get through Metro West Adolescent Health Survey, which Adam and Needham have, be able to complement that. Um, the other two things briefly, is um, the CCIT program that we're all involved in. Um, Chief Don Tremont from Dedham and, and Needham Chief Schlittler have hired a replacement for Kim Kidders Montoya, who is the Riverside Emergency Services uh, funded, shared um, through the operating budget uh, social worker. So the person's name is Chris Hutchison and that person is currently in training and according to Chief Don Tamont, ready to start very soon. So that's a huge uh, uh, accomplishment for the police because they are really committed to this model of um, ride along and support with a social service, social worker with the um, state model where they can access electronic medical records, get access to beds and work with our town social workers to really, to really support residents. So I'm happy to hear that. And the last thing is, um, I just thought it'd be interesting. I don't know if Tim and I apologize, put it in the packet, but um, <coughs> Jennifer Rowe, the assistant DA gave out the um, fatal crash data for 2021 in Norfolk County, as well as the overdose death. And for 2021, uh, there were 113 overdose deaths. And they, they collect that data by observation. And it's not just, you know, I believe from how they describe it, giving people any kind of blood test. So it's the DA's numbers of 2021, 113, Needham is listed as two. And then in 2020, it was also, according to the DA's records, 113. They broke down the ages, which I think are interesting, and um, mostly in their 30s. I can have Tim give you that. But um, for 2021, they have the age breakdown and the gender. And um, 
the DA is committed to sharing that information with us um, in prevention so that um, we can be mindful. And someone like Mary and Tiffany who are doing the Narcan training, um, it, it puts it all together and validates that all of us, um, there were only seven communities, I think, that did not um, have a record of a fatal due to overdose. And that's it. Do you know how Thanks. that compares to the like 2019, 2018? Yeah, it's on here. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'll no, I mean, it's fine. I just can, can we get no, that? It's not, it's not in there. <clears throat> can we get that oh. data for our oh, yeah. next packet? Yeah. Um, absolutely. That would be I, I, I mean, I know the numbers are going up everywhere for that. Right. I just wonder how so, much. So, in briefly, um, in 2018, they posted 124, in 2019, 103, in 2020, 113, and in 2021, 113. 89 men and 24 women in 2021. She wrote teens, two, 20s, 15, 30s, 43, 40s, 27, 50s, 21, and 60s, five. Quincy, 38, Weymouth, 14, Norwood, nine, Braintree, eight, Randolph and Stoughton, seven, Dedham, five, Foxborough, four, Holbrook and Milton, three each, Brookline, Franklin, Needham, Plainville, Walpole, two each, Avon, one, Canton, one, Norfolk, Sharon, Wellesley, one, and then zero were Cohasset, <laughs> Dover, Medfield, Medway, Nellis, Westwood, Rendham. Those are the DA's numbers. So I can give them to Tim. Send them out. Yeah, that would be helpful. That's it. Other than that, I mean, I know some of the steps in your report on the uh, community health needs assessment done by the hospital. And I was on one of those calls, uh, which is kind of interesting because they're sparsely attended. And I don't know if it's an opportunity to, I mean, basically to get funding for what we want to do via the hospital, right? Um, because, if, you know, I, there were a number of people from our department on the call, which was good. Um, but if we're able to do that and you know, to some degree stack the deck, because I think there were only maybe a dozen people on the call, uh, and I think a third of it was from us, um, we are the eyes and ears for them. They don't, they don't necessarily know what's going on in the community. Our department knows what's going on in the community. So if we want them to fund the appropriate projects, um, we should be on those calls and let them know what we need. You, you know. Um, one of the biggest things we've asked for is data. <clears throat> and um, that's helpful for staffing and Tim and Tiffany and programs and grants. Um, and Julie, we have Julie now is awesome in trying to work with BI and Newton Wellesley to get that ED data. Right, but as they work, I might be saying, hey, we need more funding for mental health in the community, particularly post pandemic. You know, one of the asks could be, you know, and in order to do that, we need to have more data for the community so that we can understand what more what's going on. To, you know, we should work on data infrastructure, um, you know, for all these social determinants because we still really don't have that here. I mean, that might be an ask for the hospital. They're doing something different too in the past year. They have grants, uh, at least Alyssa Kent, who's wonderful and works with Karen. Um, um, grant opportunities that you can write. Um, yeah. So I know we take advantage of that. Absolutely. Just another source of free money, or at mm -hmm. least other people's money. <laughs> yeah. Other people's. Okay, Carol, thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> um, so we're gonna get a few minutes back into our meeting because um, one of the items is gonna be deleted. So we're gonna, we will carry on uh, traveling meals. So Rebecca um, actually had to sign off just a couple minutes ago because she has to go to the hospital. Um, okay. Miriam is still helping with the transition um, from uh, all the sort of knowledge she's accumulated over so many years running the program. Great, but she's been getting Rebecca up to speed. Um,
as you can see, this year's volume has uh, somewhat tracked last year's. It was down for the first four months of the year, uh, up during the last next four months. Um, so it, you know, it does fluctuate. As Marianne would tell us, when uh, people no longer need the program either because they passed away or because they moved on to rehab or because they needed it and have now still recovered. Um, Could go up with the cost of food. It's where, you know, demand. <clears throat> I do think long term, um, one of my questions or concerns is just how viable it is. The hospital has been incredibly generous over the years. They provide the food. We pay for it, although, um, you know, we pay at cost or probably slightly less than cost. Uh, I do wonder how viable it is every time the hospital has a new addition. There's more meeting space, more conference rooms, potentially more beds that need food services, so we're not, you know, we're not the first priority, we're not the second priority. Um, long term, I worry about the viability. Uh, one of the things we're doing this year, uh, it's challenging, but um, Denise Garlic gave us an earmark to study whether the kitchen at the center of the Heights could be modified to run a food service operation. Currently, the center of the Heights kitchen, um, Springwell prepares food and then freezes it and then brings it to senior centers to heat up for a hot lunch for seniors. Um, we're interested in looking at whether it would be viable, physically possible within the space to modify it to run a higher volume to potentially support traveling meals and, and other meals for seniors. And if it is physically possible, is it operationally feasible? What would it take to have staff? What would the uh, food supply cost be? How many meals would you have to serve to break even? Um, we're hoping, uh, interestingly enough, a lot of, with um, ARPA money, a lot of communities are, the, the primary food operations consultant who works for a lot of like school districts helping their school cafeterias, uh, basically said they've got too much business and they can't help us. Um, so we're looking for other feasibility folks on that side. We've got um, some firms in place on the sort of, what would the architectural layout be? Is it physically possible to accommodate the space provided? What type of equipment would we need to change? Like when I go into the senior center, it seems like they have the biggest freezers in the world, but the director of school health uh, school of nutrition services previously told me that you know, these are much too small. Uh, so that's the difference between, you know, someone who thinks about their normal household and how much freezer space they have versus someone who thinks, you know, in terms of how many walk-in freezers you have. So I think that long-term is one of the things for traveling meals is figuring out what is our plan if something changes at the hospital, would we, if something isn't changing at the hospital, would we still want to potentially go in another direction? Um, one of the things that Marianne and I had explored with Tara um, was Wingate. Wingate has potentially interested, uh, expressed an interest in potentially hosting the traveling meals program. Wingate is closing, um, as the board knows there, um, part of their units in converting the assisted living space into um, higher end independent living um, locations. Um, so they are not uh, interested in that business line anymore. And while there has been proposals for redevelopment of a Carter site, uh, that has, isn't moving forward that quickly. Um, there's some question about whether the financial model is viable. Uh, a lot of uh, living operators are trying to sort of get out of the space. So Tim, until that time, <clears throat> is there any linkage between the um, 501c3 status of the hospital and payment in lieu of taxes along with the travel deals? I don't actually know that. Um, I do know the hospital does a number of you know, charitable things and, and obviously traveling meals is a charitable focus. They've never indicated that they are going to stop. I think it's just me wanting to sort of cover our bases long term. Um, and as I said, you know, the you know, it probably is smart, right? But but before um, our volunteers used to be in the kitchen helping pack the meals, and now they're sort of across the hall, and they don't get to help pack the meals; they just get to take them when they're ready. So I think you know, it sort of disconnects our volunteers a little. Space is a premium. Um, the hospital has. Um, had expressed initially concern this year about doing the, the standard practice that we have with um, 
inclement weather when there's a going to be a snowstorm on Friday, we try to deliver Thursday's meals on Thursday and also Friday's meals on Thursday. Um, and the hospital had originally said, said, I don't think we can do that anymore. We, we talked through with them the, the challenges we would have and then they said, okay, we can, we can figure it out, which you know, is a great example of how they, they work with us to try to make things happen. Um, it just seems long-term, it, it's gonna continue to be a challenge. I think yet another issue is if you use the senior centers, um, how, how, how would you staff the, the kitchen? Would you want to be volunteers? Would you have to pay someone? I think you'd have to pay someone. That's um, what I would think. And if, you know, I, I did, um, I think people know that the Center at the Heights was closed for the first uh, 15 months of the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we did when the building was closed, we did relocate. Um, so Emory Grover has, I think as people know, nothing in the way of an HVAC system. We did relocate uh, five or six staff members from Emory Grover and put them into spaces at CAF that no one was using. It was the school nutrition staff. And I did sort of ask them back of the napkin, like what would it take to run this? You know, and they gave me a, you know, you need, you know, these three roles, plus you need a backup person, you need to be looking at, you know, two and a half people each day for six hours, and, you know. Um, so I think, it, you know, it, it's an open question and we need sort of uh, better than back of the napkin type report, but it's possible. It's just a question of, you know, what, what would the cost be? Would it break even? I think the way I've been trying to describe it to people is if I can tell the town manager, we can sort of ensure that food insecure Edomites, especially food insecure seniors, We'll have everything taken care of and it'll only cost the town $25,000. I, I think we can make that happen tomorrow. If I tell her we can do that for $500,000 or $750,000, uh, I think she's going to tell me where I can find my kite. Um, so, you know, got to sort of figure out if there's any room in between and what would be financially responsible and, and what would be possible. Is there any way of contracting with Springwell? For the meals, and then it just becomes a matter of uh, assembling. So Springwell provides them now. I think they're. We have never been super impressed with sort of the nutritional quality of the meals that Springwell provides, at least in yeah. comparison to the hospitals' meals. Um, but I think that that is one option. Certainly, um, we. I, you know, there, there's a couple ways you could go if you're doing it, right? If you could think you could do a contract out like the hospital, it's not that there's really going to need them employees that are running the food service operation. I think it's, it's either Aramark or Sodexo or, or something like that, right? You can do uh, food service at any number of locations. Mm -hmm. Or you could do staff you, you hire yourself, or um, in my crazier moments, I consider, you know, the superintendent and the director of school nutrition to be willing to have a, another site, you know, we don't have the expertise to manage food service operations, but they might be able to accommodate an additional three part-time staff who are working, uh, you know, under the supervision of the school nutrition director if we provided the funding. So I think uh, all those things are on the table to be looked at and discussed. I think it's, um, you know, a kernel of an idea of something that may evolve into something within five years, but it's not a, something that's happening immediately. Well, I think it's really important to be proactive about potential changes in the program because it's a really important program that we have. And, um, you know, I mean, every meal, every month is very consistent, you know, how many meals are delivered and you know, overall. So um, I can't imagine where we'd be without it. So, and I think, you know, I do some work in kind of the nutrition space, and uh, there's really a, um, it, starting with the USDA, there's just a real interest in trying to um, to work on issues around food security. So I feel like, um, you know, recently I just did a tour of community servings. I don't know if you all know of that work. They're part of the Food is Medicine Collaborative in Massachusetts. And um, there is a ton of funding coming into groups like this who are who are doing kind of medically tailored meals, therapeutic foods um, for these kinds of populations. So um, I feel hopeful that there will be, you know, maybe other other funding sources kind of coming down the pike. Um, 
And Tim, I'd be happy to talk to you a little bit more about some of this stuff and, and what I'm what I'm seeing out there. Um, so. But I think especially because of COVID and seeing how, you know, our populations who are at highest risk and fared the worst were those with kind of diet related um, you know, illnesses, you know, obesity and other chronic diseases, that there is a lot of, of uh, interest from health insurers, uh, Medicare, Medicaid to really think about how to cover healthy food, you know, prescriptively um, for the for populations that uh, might not have access to it. Sounds great. We'd be happy to. Okay. Um, moving on. Um, next is accreditation. Uh, is Lynn on the call? Yes, I'm here. Welcome. Thanks. Um, so I, I have some things to report for this month, but I'll have much more to talk about next month because we have two new people on. We actually now have an accreditation team, which makes me very happy. Mm -hmm. well, I do want to talk just a little bit about um, our going forward for doing a community health assessment. In the past, we have worked very closely with BID Needham to, um, to kind of intensify the, the focus on Needham as opposed to the other communities. We ran focus groups, we added questions last time around. Um, this time, they conducted their um, community health needs assessment during the pandemic and um, we were not able to participate in it. There still will be valuable data for us in there. What we will be doing, which um, I'm very excited about is that we're going to be conducting another senior survey. The last one we did was in 2016, which is actually how I started with the department. Um, last time it focused on housing and trans transportation. Um, we are looking to ask a couple of questions that follow up on those issues, but expand to other issues, particularly as it relates to um, the pandemic. Um, we, are, we will probably be asking questions about isolation, mental health, food security, um, and other, and about the physical and kind of emotional after effects of COVID. Um, on the Pathways program where we were a test, we were part of the test um, to see about having a modified recognition program for small and local health departments. We received feedback on our readiness assessment and I learned that in the new, in the uh, standards just came out for 2022. So the new public health accreditation standards are out and they have changed the process somewhat rather than having prerequisites before one is able to apply, they will have all, um, all applicants participate in a full readiness assessment, which I'm thrilled about, um, because what that will do is help us focus our efforts as we move for accreditation. I'm confident that with the team, we can um, make this happen finally. And next month, we will share with you the feedback that we received on the abbreviated readiness assessment. Great. Um, so we'll look forward to that uh, next month. Uh, questions for Lynn? All right, great. Lynn, thank you for the update. Uh, and next we'll move on to environmental health. Tara or Diana or Monica. Yeah, I can start off. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I just wanted to reiterate about uh, what Tim had mentioned with a lot of staff coming on. So I've been um, helping out 
to hire and onboard new staff. Um, uh, Rebecca Hall, as you know, for Marianne and um, Jess and Cindy for Lynn and Lynn and Marianne have been great and, and basically assisting these staff and to transition them into getting on board. And Allie, as you all know, um, recently accepted that position for the full-time health agent. She'll be starting next Monday. So uh, again, helping her transition into that position. She's signed up for a lot of training courses um, to start um, getting her training for septic and pools. Um, so that will be ongoing. So that's exciting. Um, the one item I just wanted to quickly touch upon um, that we have on watch is the rice barn, as you know. So this is the establishment that we had issued an MOU on a revised MOU. And we had required, we had initially um, issued him a temporary food permit, as you know. The current food permit expires the end of March, so March 31st. So it's coming up this week. Um, he has in order to allow him to remain open to the public, we had required him to work with a food consultant, which he had uh, paid for himself. Uh, so he contracted with uh, Maureen Lee, and she has been working with him for the past couple months and started off by doing trainings through the month of um, January and February. And now March, she's doing audit inspections, you know, pop up site visits making sure the staff is now um, using the um, items that they've learned during the trainings to prove that they're able to maintain a clean and safe and sanitary establishment. So we're waiting to get the last audit from Maureen Lee uh, that will be coming up this week. So then we'll be having a meeting, Diana and I, Monica and Allie, will talk about the next steps to see if he's shown us enough improvement and progress uh, with new staff trainings. He brought on another full-time staff member and had them serve safe trained. We're waiting for that certificate. So hopefully we'll get a good report from Maureen Lee and that will enable us to again, extend his food permit. We'll have to decide at that time, um, we'll extend that for. So that's the one thing we have, we're watching on that. I don't know if Diana, you wanna add some highlights? I mean, um... Sweet Tomatoes now is on an MOU as well. Um, so we have had issues in the past with them keeping, so time as a public health control is when you take food out of temperature control and keep it at room temperatures. So this is typical for pizza places. They weren't following the proper procedures um, that they're supposed to follow by code. And now they are following the proper procedures and they are setting us logs every week um, for the next three months. They've been pretty good about that. We did a follow-up inspection. Everything looks good there. I'm trying to think, is there anything that the board was interested in hearing about? Because I know we're a little behind on time. Any, any questions? I have a question about, um, <clears throat> seems to me we're seeing a lot of these, a lot of violations of basic uh, food safety principles mm -hmm. in the restaurant. This, due to staff turnover because of COVID, or uh, do it's we possible. need a training program? So we did a training not too long ago. It was in the winter time that I had a Zoom training for all of the restaurants. It was open to everybody. Um, it was with Lisa Burger. It was a food safety 101 course. So it was every Monday for three Mondays, and all the videos are available on YouTube and all the restaurants were made aware of that. I can send it out again so that they know they have that as a resource. It's on the town's website as well in the public health section. So it's available to them um, for them to show any new staff coming on. It goes over all the very basic, you know, food safety standards. So time and temperature control, how to do sanitizer, all the very basic things. And then I'm also working with Lisa. So hopefully with the grant, we'll, we're able to fund another course. So it would be the food handler course for staff. So I'm planning on opening that up to the three towns under the shared services grant um, for restaurant managers or staff who are interested in taking the food handler course, which is a step below the food manager. So it's a little less intense, but still goes over all the food safety, important food safety topics for restaurants. We're holding that, I believe, in May and in June. 
So that will be coming down. Actually, one in April and then two in June. That's the plan moving forward. And so we will be providing them with more um, education. NCA with their shared service uh, grants that we're part of as well is also hiring, I think, Lisa Berger to do the um, food handler manager one as well for all of the towns. So okay. lots of training coming up. Recorded and people can watch No, because you have to get certified. So okay. you have to actually take the course and then take mm -hmm. the test. Yep, the food handler comes with a test as well. And they would have to sit on the test. So the point of that course is they'll do um, like a refresher and do kind of go over the important topics and then they take the test at the end of the course. So is this, like, could this be partially also, like, can people do this on their phone? Do you have to have a laptop for all the, like, are there barriers to, to getting these staff trained? The manager test, you have to be either virtual or in person, so you have to take a course and then take a test. I don't know about the food handler. I don't know if it's done just by Zoom and you can watch, Diana, do you know? That I'm not sure. I think it's the same thing that you need a proctor to actually take the, the exam because it's through, because um, I know Lisa, when I was talking to her, she has to make sure that she gets her recertification to be able to distribute the test for at least the food handler. She does food manager quite often with the company, but food handler, they don't do as much only because it's a little bit more basic. Um, but there are companies like people can do them online. The food handler training is only a two hour training online and it's cheaper. I know with the food manager, that one tends to be a little bit more expensive. So whereas food handler could be maybe like 60 to $80, the food manager tends to be in the $100, $200 range for that course. But it's also an eight hour course, usually like it's a whole day that you're doing the training. So it's a little bit more intense. Yeah, I'd like to add the rice barn situation that is, we believe, due to short staff. Um, this has been one of the biggest, I think, uh, challenges for the owner because it seems like he'll do really well and then all of a sudden he'll start doing, um, going back down and we'd ask him, okay, what's changed? Well, his main staff member left, you know, or he would move on and then he would beg him to come back and then he would, again, improve. So where he said, well, Charles, you have to maintain a full staff in order to have highly, you know, educated people and to handle food. And so he brought on a new person in addition. This is what he's reported to us. We're still waiting to get a copy of that serve safe training certificate. But he did mention to me it's hard for him to, to maintain staff, at least in his case. So okay. okay. Yeah, I, I think probably Christina and I should be kept aware of what's going on with the rice barn as we approach the end of the month, which is tomorrow. Yeah. Um, just so we're in the loop. Sure. Okay. Um, other questions on environmental health? Um, seems like there's something happening at uh, what used to be Webster Green as Hamilton Highlands, I guess, is the new name or the new property owner. Um, do you know what's what the problem? Because I'm hearing stuff up at the senior center from some people that live there. They're not happy. So. Yeah, I can give you a quick update on that. So we, we did have a lot of problems with them a couple months ago. They are getting better as far as improving. I think it was just mainly things that weren't being repaired uh, right away. The elevator was in disrepair for a while. We ended up having monthly, setting up monthly Zoom calls with corporate. It was the building commissioner. Eric Tardif was sitting in for Dave Roach at the time. And also we had Chief Condon on those virtual meetings. They actually did get their act together at that point and got the elevator fixed and had an assessment done of the elevator. So we're seeing dramatic improvement there. They're also had, they were having pest control issues, uh, which we had required them to hire a new pest control service. And now since they've hired this new service, we're seeing dramatic improvement there. So it was more or less, again, it could have been a staffing issue because we, we were hearing that the residents were calling about reports of issues that weren't getting addressed. Um, and then we found out that that staff person that was hired over there was not full-time or she wasn't 
um, getting back to people right away because she had so many on her list. So they've now hired another full-time staff person to help oversee this building. But it's basically taking you know, a lot of uh, time and effort to, to work with corporate. And it took all three departments, building health and fire to get finally them on board with following these requirements. So unless you're hearing anything recently, I've, I've been checking in with, I have a couple um, residents over there that, that will not, they're not shy about letting me know what items are not being addressed. But now she, that resident is in direct contact with the corporate contact and she's able to coordinate directly with her. I haven't heard anything in the past month, actually. I was, that was the first time in a month that I haven't really heard her complain about ongoing issues that weren't getting addressed. So. Thank you. Yeah. All right, great. Uh, thank you, Tara um, and Diana. Uh, moving on now to the COVID-19 update. So I know we have um, quite a few items left. So I just wanna say a few things uh, about the, the slides in my update. Um, and sort of give you an idea of, of the most updated data because it's obviously always changing. Um, so we saw this you know, very sharp decrease in the incidence rates and the percent positivity for Needham and all the other communities um, around us. And um, now we're sort of at the point where we're starting to see some fluctuations, some, some small increases or maybe no change from week to week. Um, you know, I put in the packet the cases for February and for March, um, just because I wanted to compare. And at the time, you know, February had 184 cases and I wasn't sure, um, you know, March wasn't really on the trajectory to get that high. Um, but sort of as we've reached the second half of March, um, we have seen a little bit of an uptick in cases. So right now we've got 139 cases um, as of yesterday, and we've still got a few days left in the month. Um, so, you know, the, the number of cases daily has gone up a little bit, um, and this lines up with what's going on in the state. We're seeing some slight fluctuations, slight upticks in um, percent positivity and incidence rate in the state. Um, the other thing I really wanted to talk about was the um, update to our COVID death numbers, um, which is the first slide in the state data. And so on March 14th, DPH updated the definitions of confirmed and probable COVID deaths and updated this in Maven. Um, so this resulted in about 4,000 deaths in Massachusetts being recategorized as stemming from other causes and about 400 being newly categorized as due to COVID. Um, this had varying impacts on each community, but in Needham, this changed our total from 123 confirmed deaths to 91 confirmed deaths. Um, and those numbers and the demographics that go uh, along with it have been updated on our dashboard to reflect these new um, definitions. Uh, and then I just wanted to talk about the, um, the wastewater levels um, because the most recent data does show, um, you know, as we're seeing these slight uptick in cases, we're also starting to see a, a just a ever so slight increase in the um, wastewater levels. So I think this will probably one of, be one of our best uh, indicators now that people are really relying much more on the uh, home antigen tests than they are the official PCR tests. Um, so we'll continue um, keeping an eye on that. But other than seeing these sort of slight increases, there haven't been any notable changes or increases in um, number of COVID hospitalizations. So that's good. And uh, if you have any questions about anything I just said or any of the other information, uh, let me know. Julie, um, uh, oh, sorry. You know, I'm, you know, just because we're going through this right now, because my, you know, my daughter um, tested positive a couple of days ago, and I'm just realizing that, you know, so through once, once um, she tested positive, you know, I wrote to the school nurse. And then she emails back a form that you have to, uh, you know, submit. And so that goes back to the schools and I guess also to the town as well. And I've just, you know, anecdotally in her class and my, my other daughter's class, you know, there, there are quite a few um, cases. And so the kids' cases get reported to the schools. 
But the parents who are getting ill, you know, I've just, you know, asked folks, have you, you know, reported it anywhere? And so they're, it's not getting reported. So they're testing positive at home and then not reporting it. And so I was just hoping that, um, is there a way that through the school nurses, because, you know, once the child's positive, we have contact with them, but that she could also encourage, you know, the web, whatever the, the link that you all are using or email, or I can't remember how uh, you're asking uh, the public to report cases, but if the school nurses could also ask family members, if you test positive, please report it to the town because this impacts, you know, how we, um, you know, just our data for the town. Um, you know, I think that would be helpful or even in, you know, our, our principals weekly send out, you know, reminders about all sorts of things. If we could through the schools, just ask family members, parents and other caregivers to respond their positive um, tests to, to the town. I think that would really give us a bit more of an accurate picture because I know a lot of parents who've tested positive who have not, you know, reported that anywhere. Yeah, I think that's a great idea because we do have the, you know, we have a Google form set up um, for people to report their uh, positive at-home antigen test to us. And I would say when we first blasted it out to the town, we got an immediate response from people who had said, oh, I'm really great. It's really great to have a place to report this. We got a ton of responses and that sort of slowed down. It comes in waves every once in a while. I'll get five or six responses at a time. Um, but it would be nice to, to continue to remind people that, that this is available and that it does help us update our numbers and, and keep an accurate count. Yeah, <clears throat> that, I think we all know that the, uh, these numbers are lower than the actual um, case rate just because there's so much home testing now, but that's, that's a great idea. <clears throat> and I think, you know, um, Steve has said this before at other meetings, but, you know, the, um, the boosted rates are still lower than we want them to be. Um, and now that BA2 is the dominant variant in Massachusetts and they've had uh, peaks in Europe, you know, that I'm concerned that, you know, we may be having another um, rise, especially as the, the wastewater data is starting to uptick just a little bit. So I think it's a good opportunity to remind people that if they're not boosted, they should be. And, you know, if they've had their primary series, you know, once, once you hit, once you hit nine months after that, your, your protection from the primary series starts to wane significantly. So I, I think it's a good opportunity to put that message out there again to get up to date. So there's also potential for a shortage, to be honest, because uh, the state ordered a pocket of vaccine that all expires at the end of April. And so how much more they have left, they're unsure at the current time. And so depending on how much more we can order is also dependent. We still have plenty through April, but all the stuff we have expires in April. So we'll keep an eye on that as well. Um, I also wanted to highlight with Julie, because you guys were talking about data earlier, she is doing some great work and working on a platform for GIS. So then we can really plug in certain um, needs that we have or things we want to look into to see where they map up along with Massachusetts. So she's doing some training. We'll get up a website at some point. Um, and all that kind of stuff. So then we can really work on social determinants of health and where they pocket out and need them and that kind of thing. Oh, from so. that state survey. Huh? From the state survey data, right? No, this will be or, this will be Needham um, specific, but also she's working with different groups to get different data. And then she's she's essentially going to be our public health data hub. So anybody that needs data will coordinate with Julie so that we have that access and they know who to go to to get that access within the staffing. And then we can also use the GIS to plug in those data sets to see if we're seeing overlap between disease prevalence versus food insecurity versus wasteland versus climate change. Like that is the goal of this project. So, okay. yeah. Interesting. It's also important to remember that last April, we also had a slight uptick bump in cases, yeah. right? Same thing. There yeah. is a seasonal pattern. Yes. These rates. We have an opportunity for boosting depending on what the CDC decides today. There's an announcement that they're going to offer a second booster to those over 50. Right. Probably sends a pretty strong message to those who haven't received a single booster that maybe this is a good idea. And, so and if they should take advantage of that in terms of public messaging. Right. And if they if they do that, I mean I they're yeah, you know, they're gonna hopefully say that people over the age of 50 have the opportunity to get fourth shot. Could we 
use some of the ones that are going to expire. Oh, absolutely. That group. Yeah. absolutely. I don't know that it's possible at this current moment in time for these next few months to hold any large clinics, but we are still doing Roth. This is people call and the state give us our blessing to pop one vial and give one shot and get rid of the rest because we just need to use it. So. Okay. All right. <clears throat> uh, questions for Julie? Oh, okay. Sorry, Julie. Hearing no questions. Thank you, Julie. We'll move on. Um, and the the next thing on the agenda is um, yeah. I was hoping I could address it briefly. Sixteen eighty eight, uh, if possible. Um, yes, please do. So uh, the board knows that we went out uh, once to try to find a licensed site professional. Uh, I've had some discussions with. Uh, license site professionals to get feedback on the scope because no one did. Uh, 17 uh, companies and individuals were contacted and no one uh, was willing to even quote any price. Um, before we've had an opportunity to go out a second time, uh, there's been a legal filing um, where Needham Enterprises, which is the LLC that is proposing the development at 1688 Central, uh, has filed suit against the planning board's decision. Um, the legal filing um, is in the packet, although Kathleen, I think, said that it came out, so somehow it got only every other page with the um, attachment. So I'm sorry about that. I can send the full packet. Um, I don't know. I think you got every page here. You did? Okay. Yeah. No, later. In the planning board decision. Yeah, in the planning board decision, yes. it looks like this. It must have been like two sided, and we only got one side. Yeah. Okay. You know, every other page is there. But yeah, the complaint took up the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I did talk uh, last night with town council. He recommended because it's the subject of ongoing litigation that the board choose not to discuss it publicly. Um, we did talk about whether there's an uh, an executive session exemption um, because the board of health is not the one being sued directly. There is not. Uh, they, there is, in some cases, boards can go to executive session and stay away from the public meeting when they are being directly sued, but because the Board of Health is not being sued to the planning board, um, there's no option for that. He, he did say he didn't think that there was much benefit to discussing it publicly, and that you know anyone who's discussing it publicly uh, in any depth is likely to be deposed either by plaintiffs or defendants' lawyers. Um, so the board always has the choice to engage in the discussion if it wants. I guess my recommendation, I think town council's recommendation is to just sort of sit and wait and, and see how the legal case develops. Um, you know, he thinks that there'll be negotiations on whether there can be a settlement or whether the case will go to, to trial. Um, in any case, it's not something that's going to be resolved in a matter of weeks, it'll be months. The question is whether this is something this board should be engaged in independently of anything to do with the planning board, right? I mean, we're, we're talking about a hazard or potential hazard to the health of the residents. We're obligated to investigate that in any sense, correct? Yes, I think the challenge is that at, at least there was not documentation of any hazardous space. There was, you know, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't want to get into exactly what, but the, the evidentiary standard was not there. Um, so unless the developer is going to afford the Board of Health or the Public Health Division access for our expert to come on, uh, and I, I don't know that that is the case, or that might be the case pending the results of the litigation, but I'm not sure. Um, I don't know that we can we have a strong enough leg to stand on to say that there is, we are aware of a danger to the public's health and therefore we have to act independent of the, the planning and zoning type decisions. And, and while this litigation is going on, there's nothing actually happening at the property. Right, and my, my only concern <laughs> is like, you know, so the litigation gets settled and, you know, building commences immediately and, you know, after the fact, you know, we discover this problem. And then what do you do about it? It's so, really messy. I mean, I mean, we, we can act, I mean, obviously we could act at that point, but boy, it's gonna get messy for whoever builds something there and say, you know, no, you gotta be me. You know? Sure, I, I think the, the challenge for us is we don't have 
documentation of there being a problem. Right. We just have an allegation from citizens that yeah. there may be a problem here. Right. That, that's all we've got right now. And well, we've been asked to investigate the question is should we, right, based on those allegations. It's all anecdotal right now. So well, and I mean, it's also it's part well, of I mean, there are photographs and all that yeah. sort of stuff. But yes. But, but there's nothing to review without a development plan. Correct. Right. So I, I so I, I guess my thought is to to wait a little bit and see if um, see what the next developments are <clears throat> and see how to proceed. Um, you know, I think we could still, um, through town council, be in touch with the um, the plaintiff's lawyers and see whether they're willing to provide access if the department is willing to retain an expert. I think the the other concern I have is just financial. I don't want to sign a contract with someone and you know they can't sure. access the site mm -hmm. this fiscal year, and then you know we have a a challenge because we signed a contract saying we have to pay, and they haven't been able to perform the services through no fault of their own. Yeah, I think discretion is a better part of valor at this point. We should just wait and see. Mm -hmm. I agree. Are the board members okay with that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, we'll move on then to uh, the synthetic turf, field turf testing and results. Um, so we have uh, an update from. Tara. Yep. Yeah, so uh, I took your questions from our previous meeting back to Gus and O'Neill, and they replied back with the red font uh, answers there. I'm hoping that does help clarify a little of the questions that you had. So basically, you know, as, as they state here, that again, they don't feel resampling for acetone is necessary because um, it is a common lab reagent. Uh, they also talked a little bit about the race base, uh, risk based values for those uh, components and compounds and synthetic uh, metal, uh, sorry, material from rubber. So, but then yeah, they. Gave, like, yeah, go ahead. It looked like acetone was also found in 2020, but not in the same, um, at the same levels. As was found in 2020. And then yeah. also interestingly in 2020, there was uh, uh, ethanol and isopropanol, which were not detected in 2021. So you know if it does make you wonder if the lab yeah. or I don't really see how ethanol and isopropanol would suddenly have um, and to be on some some locations and not others, and to have such a difference between the locations. Um, I mean, <clears throat> I think they should run a blank next time. I know it's an extra two hundred dollars for us, <laughs> but um, they should mm -hmm. just run, it. and that would help <clears throat> all of this. So then you would know what's coming from the lab versus. I do have a question about one of these responses, though, and that's the problem of sampling between multiple rain events. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons that. We're Doing this is to make sure that we don't have runoff into the water supply. Frankly, I think collecting, you know, after a rainstorm makes a lot of sense because the water is the vehicle by which this is going to get into our groundwater supply. So the proposal to do this only during dry periods or that it's only been done during dry periods is actually, in my mind, a little concerning. Is, am I reading that wrong? Well, I don't think the VOC would be in the water because <clears throat> of VOCs all wouldn't be. So but other contaminants would be in water and that's kind of what we want to know about. Everything else I thought was low, right? Below. Yes, for now it's low, right. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I mean, I'm not worried about the VOCs in the water. I think that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But what else have we missed because we're only sampling, if we're only sampling during dry conditions? This wasn't so much about off-gassing in the fields. That's not why we were doing this. We were doing this because of concerns of contamination of groundwater. Yeah, okay. So would you want samples taken solely after a rain event or both dry and rain? That I, I am not the expert on that one, but we may want to do both. Okay. I didn't realize that there was going to be a significant difference, but if there is, then I think we need to address that somehow. Okay, Tara, in the scope, maybe we can work in the blanks and then ask them the question about 
the wet versus dry sample and timing. Okay. Yeah, I can just let you know that we do schedule these site visits probably a month in advance. So it almost the luck of the draw whether we get it after wet season, but if we maybe pinpoint that in our scope on what we want, then maybe we could schedule that more, you know. So when we know there's a rainy time of year to do that. So let's make sure this, you know, I, I'm, I just have a question here, right? I, I think yeah. it makes sense, yeah. but let's make sure it makes sense before we go to a lot of okay. trouble. Like yeah. I would just, yeah, ask them what they think the difference would be. I mean, assuming this was worst case is what, because VOC was our main previously. We're talking runoff for other reasons, I guess. So we can talk about the difference. Okay. I can ask them that. So your decision as far as retesting, you, you had a question whether we should retest in the, the summer or fall. Do you have any thoughts on that? No, I don't think you need to rerun these tests. Do you, yeah. um, it's the next scheduled test, June or next fall, or we're doing every other year? Uh, we have been doing it yeah, go ahead. a bit more frequently. Mm -hmm. So if we wanted to to do it in you know this like August or this September, we could choose to do that. More than likely, if you do it in August, the it's going to be summer dry. tends to be dry. <laughs> so and fall tends to be bad. so it might be better to do in fall. Right. But we don't have to wait a whole year. I think is my point. So we could okay. we could schedule it for yeah October. Oh. Okay. But we'll get those answers on whether they think there's going to be a difference between a wet or dry and whether we could potentially do both. Mm -hmm. And we'll make sure they include the blind testing uh, as part of the study. Okay, we'll do that. Great, thank you, Tara. Uh, next on our agenda is um, pesticide use reduction. And I think that's Ali. Good morning. Um, so what I did for the PSA, um, I added, so I took your suggestions of making it a bit more neutral with the language. Um, so once I did that, I realized that, you know, the brochure would not be consistent since it was talking strictly about organic land care. So I decided to find resources that would allow for a more consistent message just throughout. Um, and so those are also included in the pack as well. So we have a greenscaping uh, brochure and that is, um, from the EPA, um, again, very kind of neutral language, but just talking about reducing pesticides, um, using alternatives if, if possible. And then it also kind of talks about other green tips like conserving water, things like that. And then a homeowner's guide to um, alternatives as well for, for pesticides or using more natural alternatives. Um, so these resources are really all integrated pest management rather than strictly organic. Um, and so I did not create a new brochure because as I realized, it would really be starting from square one if we wanted to go the IPM route. Um, so my alternative was doing just the PSA and having those resources really bolded on the bottom of a, a brochure and a handout that have that consistent message. Um, and I'm more than happy to continue to work on a new brochure, um, but I wanted to make sure that this was a better direction before um, I started to kind of rework that. This is something we're going to try and get out with uh, town water bills. Is that right? Yeah. Well, the water bills are rolling, so it you know once we decide, it will be you know the next month oh, plus two months after. after. Yeah, uh, and now they're going electronic as well. There are fewer actual bills being sent. Good point. Okay. 
Well, I guess this could be added electronically. So, um, could be an attachment on the bill, right? They've outsourced that. I was going to say, is it like a login system or is it an actual email? You get an email from an outside company that Edom has contracted with to do billing for, like, right? So, you know, your excise taxes, your water bill, you know, everything comes from this other company. They are unlikely to accept an attachment. Just, just putting it out there. I mean, you might want to just check in and see what the options are. Yeah. I don't know how many people have signed up for that system or not, but clearly the town is encouraging it because it's going to save them bundles in terms of paper, postal costs, and all of that. Can we encourage green uh, landscaping to still require everything to be paper? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just paint it. Just saying. All right. But at least initially, like a lot of people will still be getting mailed bills. I don't know what percentage, but yeah, the population will it's the first time I've heard of get it online. So. I mean, it'll happen and it'll it'll progress, but mm -hmm. it won't be like a 90% uh, uptake. I'll probably be one of the last holdouts because I resist electronic bills. I like paper. I mean... I like the CPA thing. I think it's really helpful. I like the EPA thing too. Yeah. <laughs> it's the yeah. kind of information we're trying to get out to people, I would think, how to take action. But how do you get people to read it? Um, yeah, we, so don't, we do have to start thinking of other routes, right? Like, yeah. you know, Span's got a good presence on, um, on Instagram. I think I see a lot of their stuff. We have some Boston Public Health Commission has a really good presence, mm -hmm. Boston Medical Center too. Um, I just think, yeah, like small bites, people, people aren't going to read a whole, you know, they read like three paragraphs if you're lucky. Um, I don't know if we could partner, I mean, if we have one garden store, data, right? I don't know if we have another. Mm -hmm. and if you yeah. took a, if you took a stack of these greenscaping brochures, mm -hmm. which don't say, you know, don't use our products at all, but use them intelligently. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they'd be willing to, you know, just have those there to share with people. Right. It's worth an ask. Yeah. They, can, they can always say no. They can always say no, but I mean, at least it may stay, you know, it does two things. And, you know, depending again if the business is willing, it might stay, steer consumers away from the typical weed and feed, you know, type of stuff that's, that's really excessive and provide them with, you know, an incentive to stock stuff that makes maybe more sense and is a little mm -hmm. bit more targeted. Mm -hmm. sure. mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we the local papers are getting gotten to be useless, so you can't do anything that way. Really, it's a waste of time. The tag is done too. By the way, this one, yeah, this one. The town website, possibly. Yeah, definitely yeah. link from our website. I mean, it's just that people have to go looking for that information. It's also, you know, the truck that pulls up in front of the house and sprays the stuff. I mean, I think that's what people are concerned about, and I. I don't know what you do about that. That's it's a heck of a lot safer than people doing it themselves. Right. Don't, people That's, don't realize that. I'd, ra I'd rather yeah. see a truck than somebody else out there, you know, with their little push thing, yeah. you know, going crazy. Overfeeding. Yeah. yeah. No, it's true. It's, it's well, a, a little bit works twice as much as better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, How do people feel about the public health message and the brochure? I agree that the brochure is not worth necessarily the effort to revise um, unless we have a way to it provides more information but not enough to do anything with um, I don't think I guess somewhere I mean, I, you know, if we want if we want to go you know a route that kind of involves the organic stuff I, I mean I think getting information about organic is is good. You know, it'd be one of these things where, look, if you're interested in organic, you know, here's, here's some of the benefits mm -hmm. and here's how you might go about it. But I don't think that we should be, you know, scaring people by saying, you know, oh my God, you know, never use pesticides because, you know, you're, you're killing people and killing children and all of this. We mm -hmm. just don't have data to suggest that. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have a problem with, you know, getting a brochure out that's informational. Um, I do have one that, that goes beyond what the science shows. 
you know, and we might be, you know, look, take the greenscape stuff. I mean, you know, you have, you have choices. I mean, you know, as citizens, you have options, right? Yeah. You know, these are two well-established approaches, you know, each has their own risks and benefits and here they are. And we want to make sure you have that information because both of these approaches may be better than what you're doing right now. That sounds reasonable. I think that sounds good too. Agreed. Does that provide you with some direction? Yes. Um, yeah, so the old brochure is incorporated in there. Um, the idea was to do just the PSA and then we have those resources on the bottom for people to kind of look farther into um, reducing their pesticide use. And again, I can continue to um, make a new brochure and I like that idea of incorporating, just say these are your options, IPM or organic and including both. And then we're kind of meeting both those needs and just kind of providing people with that information. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I still think, you know, the brochure that we have still would need some changes, so. Yeah. All right, thank you, Allie. Uh, the next item on the agenda is um, medical marijuana regulations. Mr. Chair, if I could, we're running a little low on time, so I wonder if we could very briefly uh, take up the board votes uh, at the end. Um, and maybe I could do a quick uh, update about other items. Maybe we could skip or postpone the discussion of entheogenic plants uh, and then leave the last 20 minutes for, for medical marijuana. Um, there's a lot there in the medical marijuana. It's a lot of staff work. Um, so I don't, it's not going to be, a, the discussion is not going to conclude today, I, I think. Um, okay. So is it okay? Uh, that's fine with me. So we'll go to the votes and get that taken care of, and then we'll move back to medical marijuana. Is that what you're proposing? Yes. So there are two um, authorizations or designations that the board does every year. We usually do them in January. This year, uh, because of the COVID spike, we, we put those off. Uh, one is sort of the annual redesignation uh, of the board's agents, so the people who are um, entrusted to act in the board's capacity using the board's powers when necessary. Um, it's not that the uh, designation expires, but we want to just sort of keep it updated. You know, if there are staff turnovers, everything we do once a year is good practice. The other is sort of an annual uh, charge to make sure that we sort of follow the science and educate and inform the community. There are some topics, obviously, that are more political than others. Um, the public health division is not telling people to vote one way or the other, but we do want to make people aware of the uh, public health impact of policies and programs. Um, so the board sort of every year sort of charges us very publicly to make sure that we do that. Okay. Um, are there any questions about that? <clears throat> no. Okay. Can we can we do that as a single vote, or does that be two votes? Uh, it would be two votes if possible. Yeah. Okay. okay. So on the on the first, just to, uh, as a designation of agents. Um, so I'll move that we designate um, Tim as our agent and um, Tara and Tiffany as alternates, as indicated. Yes, I'll second that. Okay, um, by individual voice vote, uh, Kathleen? Yes. Ed? Yes. Steve? Yes. Christina? Yes. And Rob is yes. Uh, okay, so that passes and uh, on the uh, education uh, piece and forming the community. So I have a motion to- um, Someone. Second. Put that. Okay. And uh, by voice vote again, Kathleen? Yes. Ed? Yes. Steve? Yes. Ka uh, Christina? Yes. And Rob is yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank we'll, you. We'll postpone entheogenic uh, plants, but we can continue that discussion next month. Um, there's a couple other items in the packet that are just for the board's information. The board will have to uh, reorganize as it does uh, in advance of town meeting every year, um, which would be if it chose to do so at a April meeting, that would be after the town election. 
um, with Christina choosing not to, to run both the chair and the vice chair positions will be open. So that's something the board will have to think about how it wants to configure itself once it has its new member um, or once it has its reelected member and a new member. Um, there is some information about a, a proposed legislation for private drinking water wells that's included just for information as well as um, a request from Olin College um, about a plumbing variance. Um, it's sort of a formality that the state uh, department requests that you've basically been in touch with the local public health department or local board of health. Um, nothing nothing uh, in terms of, sort of health impacts that are controversial about the choice they're making. They're choosing to uh, move from uh, specifically gendered restrooms to uh, non-gendered restrooms. Mm -hmm. So there's no... Uh, they're not actually changing any plumbing and they're not they have to change some of the partitions yeah uh and some of the signage uh some of the uh accessory holders in, in the locations but they're not uh switching any of the plumbing and they're mandated to notify of those uh, okay we could register concerns i guess if the board is willing i might register that the public health division of the board of health doesn't um is not concerned about this change and says go forth and be well um, <laughs> That would be my preference. I don't, yeah. see, I don't see a huge public health implication. That seems, yeah, yeah. seems reasonable. And it says at least one pair of gender restrooms would be left in each place, in each place in each building. Yeah. yeah. It, it is a option. somewhat, yeah, it's a formality. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if this is one of those old blue laws that uh, it was still on the books, but yeah. go for it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Represent exactly. us. Um, I, mean, I don't know if I care. I care to have a non-gendered restroom with urinals. So. Um, and then I think, uh, Mr. Chair, the, the next item is the medical marijuana regulations. Uh, so the staff has worked um, <clears throat> quite hard, and I think you can see um, <clears throat> in the packet the evidence of their work to uh, take the board's comments and feedback. Uh, this was based on the recommendation memo. Uh, I'm going to forget. Uh, when it originally was, but so the, the discussion with the board was in January. Uh, the original discussion with CIRA was um, occurred in the fall in September. Uh, they had made a number of requests um, and the board thought it was appropriate to consider those requests, but also to consider sort of the totality of the regulation and to consider um, updating the regulation as a whole. Um, so we have, um, Tiffany and, and Tara, and also Lynn, uh, and we also have Karen. So we have a, a lot of it, folks who worked quite hard on um, this effort, and you, you see their recommendations, um, and that's up for the board to discuss. So the, the major changes um, was the, it looked like a, the description. It's not no longer a uh, RMD. It's an MTC. Yes. So that that's kind of appears throughout the document. Yes. Yeah. So some of the major changes are changes of definition to meet the CCC, and then changes mm -hmm. of the numbers to meet the CCC regulations because the old ones were from DPH, um, and then. Um, a couple of the other bigger things are, and I have it That's in really paper. Pages in 10 and yeah, it's like I roll page numbers to 10 15, sorry, have the bulk of the changes. Yeah. Um, so, and, and maybe I'll go through the, the points that Sarah asked. Um, Karen wrote us this great talking note. So I'll go through those points and we can kind of look at what, what was changed. And then some of the things we're still waiting on, to be honest. So the first change was they wanted to allow coupons and discounts, right? And then we had that your guys' decision was not to continue, which is to continue disallowing discounts beyond lower prices for low-income individuals. So there's no change to that portion in the article. Mm -hmm. The second request from Sierra Naturals was that the Board of Health um, amend Article 20.6.10 to allow the logo of Sierra Naturals on promotional items. So our current one says no, 
um, but met the requirements of DPH. Currently, the CCC allows them to do that. So in that realm, um, you guys' decision, mixed response, need and public health um, division research the CCC, and they currently do allow them to do that, allow them to put it on certain things within certain respects. So we went to Cheryl Safara to find out originally if we could put it on non-edible, if they could put their logo on non-edible, if we can require certain package requirements for non-edible. And she said that comes down to advertising, which I'm not sure that we are allowed as a board to make decisions on. So in respects to this, we're still waiting for a response from Cheryl to see if we can actually say no to adding logos for advertising. That makes sense. Because we just don't know. At least Tim and I don't know. We do think that that's potentially less critical than than the logos and the packaging related to the actual edible substance yeah. itself. So mm -hmm. if they sell a bumper sticker or a t-shirt, I think that has some impact on perception of use and harm in the community. But I think I'm more directly concerned with the labeling and the packaging and the advertising on the product itself. Yeah, and that's really our goal is if it's still an edible or not an edible, like a tincture or something they're going to smoke, we would still like that packaging to be specific, but we also don't know that yet. So hopefully we'll hear back from them. And if it's a pharmacy, you can wear a CVS shirt. I don't know if it is medicine, then, right? I mean, yeah, uh, you need to know it's an, I mean, I believe it. I had a patient recently in the ED who basically took out a package of gummies unlabeled yeah. naturally. They were all THC. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then we're working her up for all preventive status. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, nice to know what, it's nice to know what's actually in those instead of finding out after the fact. So we're hoping to get more information from Cheryl, but I think it's helpful to understand what the Cannabis Control Commission allows and, and what it doesn't, uh, and decide, have the board decide what it thinks is appropriate. Yeah, from a health standpoint, we can go beyond that or not. It's up to us. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I, I think we'll, if we don't get an answer from Cheryl, relatively soon, we'll try to go through town council as well. Town council knows a lot more about municipal regulations, but a lot less about public health. So we, you often get a slightly different answer if you ask town council than if you ask Cheryl. Mm -hmm. um, I would I would suspect that our ability to regulate t-shirts and bumper stickers is limited. Limited, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yes, yes, non-existent. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just don't see that becoming the like the thing the high school kids are wearing around. The, but who knows? Maybe. But yeah, the only way to guarantee that. High school kids would choose to wear it as if we somehow figured out how to ban it. Had a bit, right? Yeah. Exactly. That's, yeah. <laughs> more interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So then, continuing okay. down the list, um, that they want, Sierra wanted us to stop approving every package before they put it out there. Um, and that's where our question about the non edible packages came out as well. Um, so it was updated with the current CCC requirements of what they have mm -hmm. that you can't have labeled on there. Um, as far as that goes, they did communicate with the CCC um, and the CCC says they do not require, they can request or the person can show, but they don't require them to be shown each package. So I think ultimately it depends on what we would like to do with that. If we still want to approve each package before it goes in, or if we want to align with the CCC, whether or not. But the adjustments have been made there of what can be on the package as well. I would think we want to see it. Knowing what happened with vape products, you know, mm -hmm. they're they're in a business. I mean, they have an incentive to stretch as much as possible. Mm -hmm. you know? And it's not such a hardship. I mean, we're, we're not we're just saying, look, just show it to us. You know, we want to take a look before you put it out there. You know, let's face it, their their advertising is getting more blatant all the time. Just drive down the highway to see some of the billboards. Yeah, I I, I agree. I like the idea of, of us having um, a chance to review these things before they're put out. 
And then do you want to change to align with the CCC in these highlighted sections about what can or cannot? I think ours were a little more strict on what couldn't be on a package versus what the CCC has, but it's really just a little bit difference in words of how they word it. We can make a, we can come up with something that's more strict, but yeah, I don't have too much of a problem with that. As long as it's reasonable. Um, and these, you know. If you're looking at page 10 here. Today? Yeah, 10. bottom of page yeah. 10. I mean, that's what, what's on here is what we would be looking for, right? We don't want things marketed uh -huh. to kids. We don't, right? Yeah. Um, featuring symbols. So uh, this should be enough, right? Uh, yeah, ours, I think previous just had certain things like if there is a snickerdoodle, we would want it labeled specific, uh, cookie, like cinnamon mm -hmm. cookie instead. Mm -hmm. um, so we could add just a few descriptives of what an example would be. So yeah, they're basically the same thing we'd be looking for. I mean, I just don't, I don't want it to be a situation where we're like nitpicking. Well, yeah, but we also had the one that was like the looked like candy. I can't remember what it was, but it was medicine that they showed us the packet, yeah. the previous packet. And some of that was really not even well. Yeah, that's the point. I mean, I think if they know that they have to show it to us, they're yeah. first off less likely to market it. And secondly, if they have something that they think that they think really, you know, meets the requirements and it does, you know, it gives us the opportunity to say, all right, maybe we need to revise this a little bit, you know. Can it can they do a product that's packaged in somewhere else and then when they sell it and need them, they put it in a brown bag with a brown, like in another package. Like what's packaged? You know I, mean, I mean, I, the package has to be sealed. So I would assume potentially if they want to be sketchy. <laughs> but I mean, I I'm just saying, uh -huh. yeah. It's so but nice. I think this actually might be of interest to them because there is allowance now that, you know, you can sell someone else's uh, infused product at your mm -hmm. establishment. So mm -hmm. someone else in another part of the state might not be bound to Needham's labeling requirements. So is there any option for them to say, I've got this wrapped thing of cookies, if I put it in right. a bag or a box or something that has this information that Needham requires, is that actually sufficient mm -hmm. to meet the board's needs? So I guess, I don't know, Diana, if you have more expertise on that, if you, if you look at a package from Sierra and it's like in a box, would you open it up? I mean, when they, package their stuff they have these mylar bags that are not supposed they're not see-through at all it's supposed to cover everything i think it was like the certain items that didn't have the childproofing because i know with all the edibles they have like the double zippers um if they're little cans for the gummies they have a mechanism that you can't just like twist it open you have to push down it's a uh, childproofing packaging anything that doesn't have childproofing packaging they have these mylar bags that weren't see-through and also have the double zippers that are hard for kids to open. So it, it was like flour or something that you could like cut the package open. They're supposed to give you that Mylar bag as like a way to store it when you're home. But I don't know about them like putting, like if they got another brand's edibles and like placing that in another box, like that has have a, something. Right. It should be good. I was thinking of a solution for them too, that it's yeah. something they can sell somewhere else. But yeah, I mean, just the same way as we couldn't stop any individual from purchasing that and then put it into, you know, yeah. some candy yeah. colored wrapper or what yeah. have you. You yeah. know, I don't do that, okay. but yeah. yeah, I think we can only control the point of sale. So as long as okay. they're selling it generic, in a generic wrapper, we're good. Okay. Yeah. So then we'll do that. Um, I was going to say, do we only have the power of like what Sierra is producing? To regulate that piece, we have the power of what they sell in their store if it's an edible, right? Yeah, understanding. So because they haven't gone that route, but I know I've, like what was being brought up is that other dispensaries are selling other companies' products. So I'm thinking like if they had a container that was like bright yellow, I think we also need to clarify that because I found that a little bit confusing with our regs just defining like what is you know, attractive to kids. Like, I don't know if we need to be more explicit about the color thing and the font thing, because I feel like they can argue it both ways. Mm 
And that's the problem I think with the CCC rig that I think it's a little, that's my opinion that I think it's a little too general and it's hard to, there's no like hard definition of what is attractive. I think, I think that might be a little difficult too though on both ends, to be honest, because we could say something was less attractive to kids and they might think it, it's too, sub, what is the word? Subjective, yeah. not, not objective mm -hmm. enough. Okay, so we can look at that. Okay, so then with number, the fourth request they had was uh, submit Corey reports. Um, and it looks like the decision was um, like to reserve the right to ask a report report. So it was adjusted in the article that um, we can ask upon request to All see right, the court report. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So, and then posted prices, some other concerns that came up in January's meeting was about posting prices. Um, and we added in them, they display a list of product prices with the MTC, as long as it's not visible from the outside of the MTC. Um, the CCC also has regulations, which are stipulated in there about where and how you can post and what you can stick on windows and certain things. And then the town of Needham also has requirements of advertising outside of your building as well. So both of those, I'm not sure the town of Needham made it in there, but we'll put in their regulations so it aligns with it, um, that they would have to match those. Um, but the CCC requirements state you can't just take a big sign with a picture of marijuana out on their thing with pricing and you can't do that anyway. Needham has signage, uh, size and requirements. Uh, yeah, so it can go. How far they can extend off the building and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So both of those will be added in. Um, I think those are the bold. Any questions? There was one other change, I think, about um, uh, home cultivation. Yeah, just the CCC determined that the 60 day yeah. supply is 12 plants, not 10 plants. 12, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 12 from 10. More. Oh, and one other big thing to um, our last regulation set for that we would only regulate nonprofit and Sarah is not a nonprofit, so we will be taking that out of the regulation. So, and that was something with the DPH previous, and now they've allowed people to convert from nonprofit to profit status. So, you say that the vote is required, Tim, but are we still waiting on information from Cheryl? So, um, I don't believe it's appropriate to vote this month. It wasn't, it was posted as a discussion, not as a um, okay. official notice for a hearing. Um, I do think we would probably, uh, the board can tell me if it would, we would want to sort of make Sierra aware of right now the draft responses, see if they have any suggestions or feedback. We sort of open this back up at their request. Um, I don't believe the board sort of owes Sierra anything, but you know, Sierra made some requests. The board said, you know, no to most, clarified some of them, and, and did accept, I believe, one or two of the yeah, the quarry requirement. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, you know, and maybe they can. You can always ask them to. You know, if they want, they can make another argument for why change needs to happen. But um, we would, if the board wants, we would schedule a hearing for the next board meeting. We would provide public notice of that, um, and then that would be an opportunity to hear public feedback, take comments. That would be assuming we get an answer from Cheryl. Or Cheryl, yeah. Only we need someone on the MHB board that could help with that. What 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 was the ask that we didn't give in? On, we we didn't agree to the labeling uh, that we'll still review the labels and the advertising. On and the discounts. And the discounts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The discounts, I think, is very big one. Yeah. They did want something with product pricing, and mm -hmm. we changed a little bit on that. Mm -hmm. Right? Just yeah, yeah. Inside, just to post outside. it next to the yeah, yeah. thing yeah. inside the yeah. store. Yeah. So that was a small change as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think that makes sense to do that. But after we've heard back from Cheryl, yeah. then we can address everything at once and then yeah. vote. Okay. I think we're on time then, yeah. <laughs> I know, miraculously, we I'm went from being way behind. It's <laughs> now 11 o'clock, so it's <laughs> perfect. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> yeah, and um, I'll note that I think this is going to be Christina's uh, last meeting. And the election's um, April 12th. Yes. So. The election's April 12th, and our next meeting is April 27th. So, Christina, I want to thank you for your service. 
the board and you know you've been a very respected and influential voice and we are going to miss it and Absolutely. we wish you all the best i agree yes. thank you thank you so much um you know i just want to say it's really been a privilege for me to one, serve with all of you and learn from all of you and to serve the community. I think particularly in these past three years, I feel like 2019 um, was so markedly different from the last two years that we've had. And I do wish I could continue. There's, um, I think I've shared with, with a, a few of you who've inquired, just there's a little bit of uncertainty on my part of um, where I might be. And so I, I didn't want to, to take this on, um, you know, knowing that. Um, and I think we're super lucky to have a great team here in this town. I mean, really, I was reading each of those bios last night, just thinking, wow, this is a really talented and interesting uh, group of people. And I'm grateful to all of you for everything you do. Um, and I think one of the, the bright spots that came out of this pandemic is that the community especially um, is seeing what local public health does. And I think we are at a good uh, point to make the case for, um, for what we need to do the work that we do. And so I just want to say that if I can be of help in the future um, as an advocate for, for public health in Needham, please reach out. Um, I'm not going to be a stranger to you, and I'm sure I, I might um, be speaking in front of you advocating for something <laughs> in the coming days too. So thank you. And Rob, I really i am grateful for for your voice this past uh, year, I think you've read you really um, lead with with a lot of a lot of compassion, and um, I think that's been clear to the to the community and to me as well. You know, being being vice chair with you, I appreciate that, and I appreciate all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, definitely don't think you're getting away because we will definitely be. We'll get drafted again somewhere. Consulting you and uh, seeking your opinion. So, uh, and, you know, we wish you all the best. Thank you. Okay. I think that's everything on our agenda. And uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Town meeting comes.